True Chronic. Allison and Stacey. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What is this? We're gonna teach you how to skip rope, so grab your rope. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host. You're joking, right? And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome, everybody, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Yes. Episode 140? 140, you're right. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And we, uh, oh, sorry? And we, I was going to tell them that we are their hosts, but, you know, they probably knew that. Oh, okay. Well, today we have a show for you. They probably already knew that as well, but that's why we're here. We've got a great story for you. It is another winner of our Broken Mirror Story Event Contest extravaganza deal. And uh, two, yeah. two, I need two more words two and then we can continue. Thing. All right. Uh, Don't hurt yourself, all right? Uh, Dilio. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I got greedy there and I yeah, paid you the asked price. for it. Okay. What is that uh, story? What is that broken mirror story? What is that winner of the broken mirror? So what is that that we've got tonight? The story is called Linger by Are You all right? Oh, baby. It's a scary sound at first. It sounded like maybe a crack had opened up to hell and they and things were coming out, but it turned out just to be your son. Cool. Which I, I, apparently is how he was brought into this world. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, this name of the story? The story is called Linger by Sam Schreiber. <laughs> Sam Schreiber. <laughs> Can you sing the uh, Cranberries Linger with me for a moment, sir? In fact, uh, we invite the listening audience to sing it as well. The funny thing is, I can I couldn't understand hardly any of the words out of that dang song, except for basically just the, do you have to, do you have to, do you have to let it linger? I could probably get a little laugh. Oh, I thought the world of you, but that's about it. It's just your attitude. It's tearing me apart. Anyways, yeah, that was uh, something we should abort. Abort, abort, abort. Let's just cut that part out. Okay. Hey, R-O-8-O-T. I know we haven't called on you in a long time, but... Wait, hold on a minute. You know what? You know why O-8-O-T hasn't said anything in like a month? Because I haven't come up with something clever for him to say? Well, that too, but he hasn't been plugged in. He's been unplugged this whole freaking time. Wait. Oh, no, he is plugged in. I think he's broken. Oh, well. I think, oh, shoot. I was about to ask people to donate to the show and we would fix him, but but Larby Gallagher could donate hundreds of dollars to the show and I wouldn't fix our auto Oh, shoot. I wonder what's wrong. It looks like he's frozen. I, the light is still blinking, but it looks, it's like when the, the pinwheel just spins and spins, you know what I mean? It just, it's blinking, but it's not doing anything. Yeah, you did that when I asked you for two more words. <laughs> you know what I think it might be? What? Karma. <clears throat> oh. Do you remember off the top of your head what that broken mirror prompt was? No. Write it down for me, pass it over, and I'll read it. Okay. I'm going to pass you this piece of paper. Here you go. Okay, thank you. Okay, the prompt was... There was a young man from Nantucket who's... Hey, what the... This is not the prompt. Okay, I think I can get it off the top of my head. The phone rings in the middle of the night. The person on the end of the line only says one word. But it is enough. Okay. So, uh, again, if you're just joining us, if this is your very first Dune Steve episode, the assignment was to write a story... Based on that prompt, we tallied the votes, and this was one of the winners. That's right. One of the top vote getters. And so this is, uh, who is it? Sam Schreiber. Sam Schreiber. <laughs> like any time I hear a German word like that, I just have to say it with that kind of a, an accent. I have a hard time just saying, this is by Sam Schreiber, and not saying Schreiber. Mein Herr Schreiber. I don't know why. You want to know what Schreiber means, though? Do you know? I don't. I would like to know. Yeah. Sam Schreiber means Sam writer. Oh, wow. 
That's right. This man who wrote our story is named Sam Ryder. Wow. <laughs> so anyways, he's got a great story for you. Do we have an intro for him at all? Right. About the author. Author Sam Schreiber currently makes his home in Brooklyn, New York. He has an MFA in fiction from New York University, where he also has taught creative writing and currently serves as a writing consultant. His fiction has appeared in Lambeth Quarterly, the Conflict of Interest podcast, Cavalier Literary Couture, and at Podcastle. And, and who is it that produced this episode, sir? Uh, today's episode was produced by a first-time producer, Gino Moretto. Oh, buongiorno, I'm Gino Moretto. Would you like to eat some gelato? I don't think that's going to work with this one. Gino is a Kiwi. He's from New Zealand. Well, he lives in New Zealand. He was actually born in, in Britain, and it really doesn't fit with any of that whole de thing. So, oh, sorry. That's no fun. No gelato for you. All right. Well, thank you. Gino, uh, he, Gino has done episode art for us. In the he past. has. He's done several uh, pieces of episode art for us. And he did the episode art for today's story as well, which is this awesome looking uh, picture that you perhaps see right now on your MP3 player or phone or iPad or other device. <laughs> so, did you see that great big spider he did for Drabblecast? I had to change my fruit of the looms after uh, I saw You know what? Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember that one. I was showing you that one. He did art for this, but I, I don't think I've seen it, have I? Yeah. That's the reason why you got him to do the cover for our other things, because you looked at that one and went, oh, that's awesome. Oh, it's the guy with a hoodie on yeah. and a black face. Sorry, African-American face. Oh, Rish, did Mrs. Outfield ever have any children that lived? Um, without any further ado, adieu to you. And you, and you, and you. Maybe we should move along to the story now. Linger by Sam Schreiber The phone rings twice before I reach out for the receiver. I usually manage to answer before the second ring, but tonight I'm slower than usual. I don't know why. Most nights I do nothing but lie in bed and hope it remains silent. Keller, I say. O'Malley. The man on the other end says before hanging up. He doesn't like talking on the telephone. He doesn't really like talking at all, but he especially hates the phone. My wife moans as I slip out from under the covers. Work, I say quietly. It's not a lie, exactly. What did I want? Go back to sleep. She says, turning over on her side. I'm sorry, I say, pulling a shirt on. I can't. Snowflakes, the first of the year, are falling by the time I make my way to my Lincoln Mercury. I should have worn a sweater. The cold doesn't bother me, but I'll stand out in nothing but a t-shirt and a jacket. The radio comes on when I turn the key in the ignition. NPR, I think. My wife must have left it on when she parked. I switch it off before putting the car into gear. I don't like disembodied voices any more than the man on the phone. It's not hard to find O'Malley's once you know how. It's tucked between Utica and Flatlands on Avenue K. The man, Matthew, is sitting in his usual place, a tall glass of lager at his elbow. It doesn't look as though he's touched it in hours. Matthew doesn't come to O'Malley's to drink, or speak, or do much of anything but stare at the wall. I imagine he tips well. I don't know why they would put up with him otherwise. Matthew, I say, sidling up to him at the bar. You dressed for the occasion, he answers. I've never been able to place his accent. It's deliberate and even, with no telltale emphasis of rhythm. 
Well, you look terrible, I tell him. It's true. Matthew's skin hangs loose over his jaw and cheekbones, and his hair is thin and flaccid along the side of his head. The only thing about him that distinguishes him from a homeless man or a junkie is his pressed suit and overcoat. He shrugs and pushes his glass forward a few inches. I can't muster any real sympathy for Matthew himself, but his eyes worry me more than anything. His irises are watery and gray and look smaller now that his eyelids have begun to sag. Still, he doesn't stand out so much in a place like O'Malley's. Not standing out is our principal occupation, Matthew and I. So, I say, what can I do for you tonight? Matthew reaches into his overcoat, withdraws a slip of paper, and slides it down the bottomy with fingers that should be arthritic. This is the address. A local, I say, examining the address. Matthew has sent me all across the continental United States and overseas. The trips are never pleasant, but I had been hoping to return home tonight and book a flight tomorrow. It has to be tonight, Matthew informs me as if reading my mind. I've intercepted the 911 call, but there's no telling what she'll do or who she'll talk to. Can you tell me anything else? I ask, folding the address in half and slipping it into my jacket pocket. Friends? Family? Matthew shrugs again. The stiffness of the gesture is hard to take. For a moment, he looks less like a man than a gnarled old tree. She's one of us now. What else matters? One of these days, I'm going to ask Matthew why he still does this. I should ask him soon. If I wait too long, the question itself might become unnecessary, because I will be just like him. It's my greatest fear. Although, that isn't saying very much at all. I park a few blocks down the street from our apartment on Dorothy Place and 29th Street in Queens. There's a playground across the street and a few teenagers in puffy coats are passing around a tall glass bottle in a brown paper bag. One of them, a lanky kid in a wool cap that's too large for his head, gives me a hard look. You look lost, he says to my back as I walk by. Two of his friends <laughs> snicker. I ignore them until I hear the scuff of sneakers on the sidewalk. I said... I heard you. I'm not. It isn't too difficult to make my voice sound normal, but it's a relief to let it sink to a more comfortable, if less earthly, register. The laughter falters. I turn around. It also takes a certain amount of concentration for my kind to animate our faces. Matthew doesn't even bother. Alone at a bar, the effect isn't so noticeable. But on the street, in the dead of night, that's a different story. But thank you, I say, for your concern. I let my eyes settle on the boy with the wool cap. The laughter dies altogether. There was a time when that would have given me a twinge of satisfaction. But all I feel is a vague sense of gratitude when they back away, then scurry into the night. Her apartment is only two blocks from the playground. The door to the building is locked, but a precise rattle of the doorknob is all it takes. I've had practice. I can hear the sound of pacing as I walk up the wood panel stairs. A woman on the third floor. I double-check the slip of paper Matthew gave me before knocking on her door, more out of habit than necessity. Who are you? She demands when she sees I'm not the EMT she's been expecting. Now is... <laughs> Really not a good time. I realize I haven't made my face move since frightening off the teenagers, and so I summon up a small smile. She's attractive, with square shoulders, thick black hair and olive skin. Her features are symmetrical, but not too delicate, which could be a blessing in years to come. I'm sorry, I tell her before she can close the door, but I'm the one you want to see. She doesn't say anything. You had an accident earlier this evening. What? I... I... No, no. No, no, I didn't. You called 911, I say matter-of-factly. How? Her voice trails off. Already, it's sounding unfamiliar in her ears. She's younger than I was when this happened to me. Twenty-four, twenty-five at the most. But that probably won't matter much. 
May I come in? I ask, taking a step forward. No. She says. Please. I need to wait for an ambulance. There's no ambulance coming, I say, then introduce myself. My name is Levi Keller. And that's supposed to mean something to me? Her voice rises in pitch, though not as much as she probably meant it to. I don't ask again, but simply walk past her. She doesn't stop me. There was a time when I would have told her I was a junior partner at a law firm in Manhattan, and that I'd moved to Park Slope in 1998. But I say nothing more about myself. What's happening to me? She demands through uncooperative lips. Why are you here? You had an accident, I say again. I did not have an accident, she exclaims. She reaches for her face, expecting to find tears. There aren't any. All right. I concede the point because in the long run, it doesn't really matter. She raises her fists as if to box me, then lets them drop to her sides. What's happening to me? I know it feels strange. What? She interrupts me. What feels strange? What? What is this? I can't... Uh... She runs her hands over her body, then her face. She's surprisingly brisk. In life, she must have had a great deal of energy. I take it as a good sign. I shouldn't, not after all these years. But I suppose I can't help myself. Why don't you tell me what happened tonight? I suggest. This, this, this is crazy. She says, sitting down on the other end of the couch. You don't even know my name. Martha, I say. Your name is Martha Delmonico. She lets out a laugh that sounds like a bark. Uh -huh. Well, she tells me. That just makes me feel so much better. <laughs> Thank you for that. I give up trying to break the news in stages. She's clearly having none of it. What I have to tell you is going to come as a shock. I let the words sit for a moment. I didn't have an accident. She says again. She seems very resolute on this point. Martha, you died. I imagine that if you were to tell a living woman she was dead, provided she was in a position to consider the possibility, it would provoke a great number of reactions. Disbelief, shock, anger. They would all erupt in a visceral cascade of emotion. The irony, I suppose, is that telling a dead woman she is dead provokes nothing. What Martha Delmonico is feeling this moment is no different than what she was feeling the moment before. Sometimes I think that's a blessing. A tincture against unmanageable, unreasoning despair. That's not true. She says, deadly calm. I'm afraid it is. She slaps my face. I let her. She raises her hand to strike me again then stops. You mean... medically? She says. It's not a question. I died. My heart. Stopped. Then it started again. She reaches for her own throat to take her pulse, then leaps to her feet, as if her defunct jugular vein had delivered an electric shock. You'll learn how to make it beat again, I tell her. But strictly speaking, it isn't necessary. You need help, you know that? She stomps away from me towards her door. Whoever you are, you need help, and so do I. I'm... I'm going to the hospital. I don't think you understand. You don't have a pulse, I inform her. And strictly speaking, you're not breathing. I know it feels as though you are, but you're just cycling air through your lungs and letting it out again. Your body isn't removing carbon dioxide because your cells aren't using any oxygen. Martha snorts indignantly as she takes a leather jacket from the coat rack. You won't need a coat, I continue, because your body stopped regulating its own temperature hours ago. You'll be unable to provide urine or stool samples to your physicians. If you let them inject fluids intravenously, your body will simply... A glass vase explodes against the wall inches from my head. I'm surprised at how fast she can still move, how easily the rage... Or the facsimile of rage, at least, comes to her. Shut up! Just shut up! There's no restraint in her scream. It shakes the room with its inhuman force. There's no one home in the apartment below. But they would have felt it. 
A glass teeters on the edge of her counter, then quietly shatters against the linoleum floor. I sigh, wiping droplets of water and blood from my face. Then I pull my shirt up over my head. Martha is unmoved until I strip the white bandage from my chest. My wife has never seen me without it. After the first few years, she stopped asking when I would take it off. Martha stares at the deep, Y-shaped rupture in my chest. I repeat the same words Matthew spoke to me the first time we met. It feels exactly the way you thought it would, I say. Martha backs against the wall of her apartment and slowly slides down as her legs buckle beneath her. Were you this bad? She asks later, smoking a cigarette she's fished from her coat pocket. When it... when it happened to you? I was worse, I tell her. I beat the man who told me until his jaw was hanging from his head... He could have stopped me, but I don't think he cared much one way or the other. I tried to get drunk afterwards, but that didn't work so well. Mm. Martha groans. She hasn't moved from where she collapsed by the door. I've kept a respectful distance. So, um, what still works? She asks. It all still works, I say, understanding the question intuitively. But for the most part, eating, drinking, sweating... <laughs> Not this, obviously. She blows smoke through her nostrils and examines the cigarette between her fingers. I can't feel a goddamn thing. She flicks the cigarette forward, then shifts her body so she can grind it out with the toe of a boot. Drugs of any sort don't have an effect on us, I tell her. But our bodies still work. You can even heal. Faster than you could before, in fact. I touch my fingers to my face where the nicks from the ceramic shards of vase have faded to white lines. You just have to make it happen. Nothing will be unconscious anymore. So you... keep that hole in your heart as what? A souvenir? A, a visual aid? I shake my head. You can't heal the wound that killed you. I watch Martha carefully for clues as to what part of her I've just doomed. But she doesn't seem to react to the news. So it's, it's all fine. I'll be... like I was before. No, I tell her. You'll be able to do the things you did before, some of them much better, but you won't want to. Why wouldn't I want to? Martha asks. You can eat a steak, for example, I say, and you'll know that it tastes like a steak, but you won't enjoy it any more than you'd enjoy eating a piece of cardboard, and you'll have to spend the next eight hours forcing your stomach to produce acids to dissolve the entire thing. Your body won't absorb the protein. Then you'll have to force it through your large and small intestines. It won't be pleasant. You could digest it bit by bit, but if you take too long, you'll just smell like rotting meat. I'm a vegetarian, Martha says miserably. Good, I say. Vegetables and starches are easier. Do I even want to ask about sex? You could, I say. But I think the steak conversation just about covers that topic. Martha buries her face in her hands. I consider telling her that it helps to have someone else around and that pleasureless physical intimacy isn't so great a price to pay. I consider telling her that I have a wife, but that would prompt questions I am not prepared to answer just yet. It may be part of my job, but I can't bring myself to give her false hope. So... So that's it. She says through her hands. It's just... Nothing. I pause. The question would have sounded nonsensical to the living, but I know exactly what she means. She's asking if there is anything that can make her feel anything else but this. Art, I finally say. Museums are good, television as well. Although I would stay away from movie theaters. You won't be able to ignore the size of the screen. Or the darkened room, or the voices you won't be able to place, I add silently. What about music? Martha asks, a hint of desperation in her eyes. She doesn't know it yet, but putting on a pair of headphones, closing her eyes, and listening to a voice, any voice, no matter how raucous or soothing, is the worst possible thing she could do. Live music, yes, I say eventually. 
in small venues or outdoors, preferably well lit. This seems to satisfy her. There's um, something I don't understand. Martha withdraws her pack of cigarettes, then remembers their uselessness and tosses them away. Now that I'm dead, can I die? Uh, as in stop moving, stop thinking? Most of my kind don't ask that question. At least not right away. It's a good question, of course. Logical. Prescient. But it's a question I never wanted to be asked because, as it turns out, death has not made me a better liar. I don't know, I tell her. I wonder that myself sometimes. But there's others, right? Like, like you and me, someone's gotta know. I pretend to consider this. It's possible, I say. But we keep to ourselves. Martha narrows her eyes, as if sensing my deception. I think she might ask me how I knew to come here tonight, why she's never heard of this kind of thing before. But all she says is, Well, that just figures, doesn't it? I should ask more questions. It's my job to ask more questions. But she lobbed a vase at me with the strength of a decent shortstop. Her voice, her real voice, is as powerful as any I've heard. I stand preparing to make my concluding remarks. You won't feel pain, I inform her. Not even the pain that comes from overexertion. This will make you stronger than most people. You'll perceive more, your memory will be more accurate, and you'll find it easier to concentrate on tasks. And that's supposed to be what? Some kind of silver lining? Not quite, I tell her, offering my hand. I'm telling you this because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. I made that mistake once. Displayed my powers too conspicuously. Worked nine days straight without eating or sleeping. My wife and co-workers were simply concerned for my health, but no one worked out just how effortlessly or unnaturally I had carried out my duties. There's, there's one more thing. Martha says, accepting my hand and letting me pull her up to her feet. She can sense we are winding down, that my time with her is coming to an end. I think she may ask if we will see each other again. I hope she does not. For her sake, I hope we never do. Yes, I tell her. Tell me. What's with the voices? In my living days, my face would have frozen. Now I wish she had asked me when she could see me. I wish she had asked me anything but that. Voices? They're not loud. She says. And I... I can't make out any words. I don't even think it's English, but I, I can hear. Ah, uh, it's something. You think maybe... Martha reaches for her head. You said... We never heal from the thing that killed us to begin with. Your... accident? It wasn't an accident. She says again. But there's no anger in her voice now. For a moment, neither of us speaks. Pills? I ask. Demerol. She admits. A whole lot of Demerol. I swiped him from work. You think maybe they're messing with my head? Everything else seems pretty clear. It's just the voices. I don't hear them all the time, but... Ugh, oh, when I... When I do? <laughs> Martha actually hugs her shoulders. If Martha overdosed, the Demerol almost certainly killed her by stopping her heart. Brain damage doesn't tend to be a problem for the dead. I've held cogent conversations with men with bullet holes in their skulls. That must be it, I tell her. I don't know why I'm lying. It doesn't matter what I say now. I wish I could tell her to run as far and as fast as her cadaverous legs can carry her. But I can't. I have no choice. The sun is beginning to rise when I leave Martha Delmonico's apartment. I'm only mildly surprised to see Matthew standing across the street. Something the matter? I ask. He gets right to the point. There's an army staff sergeant in Kabul who's missing a leg and six pints of blood, Matthew says, 
People are starting to ask questions. It can't wait. For the first time in years, I curse. Why me? Matthew ignores the question. How is she? Something about the way he asks tells me he already knows. She only had a week, I tell him. Maybe less. So little time. She was hearing voices already, I say curtly. Hours after dying, without anyone telling her what to listen for. Making a second trip wasn't worth the risk. You're probably right, Matthew says, somewhat indifferently. And about you, Keller? Are you hearing anything above a whisper these days? There is very little that can make our kind shudder. But there is the sound of the restful dead calling out to us, slowly growing loud, maddeningly loud, over the course of years, decades, or in the case of Martha Delmonico, days. Thanks to me, though, she didn't even have that. Not that you'd tell me. Matthew says, turning his back to me and walking slowly up 29th Street. But I thought I would ask. Did she go easily? The newly dead have a spark sometimes that can be difficult to manage. But then, you know that. I remember holding him up by the lapels and pummeling his face with my insensate fist. I don't know how he knew then that I was sturdier than most walking corpses. But he did. He knew I was like him. Built for a long, measured death. What do you want from me? There is an intimation of my natural voice seeping in. I don't especially care. I want you to do your job. That first night we met, I say, following behind him. I think I had the right idea. Tell me, Matthew says. What would you hope to accomplish? You think it would be worth the risk... Letting the voices in their head drive them mad? Some more slowly than others, I point out. I look at you, and I look at me, and I'm thinking, you died when? 1950? 1940? 1840? It's the most I've ever said to him on the subject. Matthew astonishes me with a smile two or three muscles tugging half-heartedly at the corners of his mouth. You don't think she had anyone she would have wanted to say goodbye to, at least? I press on, gesturing back toward Martha's apartment. Maybe she did. Matthew agrees. Maybe there were people she would have liked to say goodbye to. Maybe there were many people she would like to take with her. Maybe mad, wandering cadavers would be bad for the living world. Maybe they wouldn't be so convenient for you either, I point out. Maybe you're afraid someone will put two and two together and lock you in a coffin until the voices come for you. The rising sun halos Matthew in streaming grays and golds, but turns his face to a black silhouette. Take it from someone who knows, Matthew says. You're going to be doing this for a long time. Longer than me, maybe. If I were you, I would make peace with how things have to be. Matthew walks woodenly away from me. His footsteps are swallowed up by the end train as it roars into the Astoria Boulevard stop. Soon enough, there's no sight of him. I turn back to where I parked my car. The memory of Martha Delmonico's black eyes going wide as the sound of my true voice filled her apartment is never going to be less fresh than it is now. Whatever it is that animates the dead can be blasted free of the human frame with surprisingly little force, when one knows how. Martha won't be my last. My wife is still asleep when I walk silently into my brownstone. There's a chance I'll wake her if I get back into bed, but I don't want to simply dress for work and leave. I wish I could tell her how much I envied her the heaviness in her eyelids at night. How important watching us sleep and listening to her breathe is. I need it to remember what I used to be. But I can't tell her any of that. So instead, I undress, slip under the covers, and wait for her to wake up. I think maybe I'll take her to breakfast. Maybe I'll order something more substantial than coffee. 
penance for Martha Delmonico. Penance for all of us. Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed the story. I know I did. Author's note! (laughs) Who read this? It was you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was, and then he called and he said, O'Malley's bastard. And now, a word about today's story. I didn't think of Linger as a zombie story until Lila Wilde described it that way. The funny thing is that I usually hate zombie fiction that strays from the Romero model. But no surprise for the writer. Well, you know the rest. No, I, uh, what, what the hell's the rest? I'll tell you later. I liked the idea of one word being enough, but ultimately I was more interested in the idea of disembodied voices. I'm glad to have a story on the Doonstief, by hook or by crook, and look forward to the next Broken Mirror contest. By Jove. Oh, uh, we prepared some questions for Sam Schreiber. Yeah, we did. For all the Broken Mirror story winners... uh... So the questions go as follows. How much of this story came from the prompt Rishin Big gave? And how much came from a previous story you had thought of in the past, Sam? This wasn't a story that had been rolling around in my head before I heard the prompt. So I guess the credit goes to Big and Rish on that front. How did you decide what the single word spoken over the phone would be? Did you start with that word and go from there? Or did you have to shoehorn the phone call into the tale as you were going along? As you can tell from the story, I wasn't especially concerned with what the single word spoken over the phone would be. I was more interested in why the speaker on the other end was so eager to get off the phone. The idea of disembodied voices and what they signify to the recently and incompletely departed sort of evolved from there. Cool. You are a champion, my friend. How confident were you in entering the contest that you would be one of the winners? Did you have a feeling while writing it, when it was done, before writing it? Ever. 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 Let's just say this isn't the first time I've tried to get my fiction on the Doonstief. Does that mean he wasn't confident then because up until now it hadn't been seen there? I don't know. It almost seems ominous in his, his response there. Um, but before <laughs> I start... Let's just say, if Rish says my name Schreiber again, then I'll be showing up at his house with a knife. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we also have a cast list for today's show. Let's see. First of all, Levi Keller, our main character, was played by Rish Outfield. Mrs. Keller was played by Debbie Cowens. Matthew was played by Big Anklevich as well as the lanky teen in the wool cap. And Martha Delmonico was played by Tatiana Gomberg. Wait, isn't there an interesting story behind the whole Tatiana Gomberg? Well, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Tatiana Gomberg! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sam Schreiber suggested... I'm sorry, who? Sam Schreiber. I, I, I can't quite hear you. Could you... Uh, <laughs> one more time, please? I refuse. You're no fun. Sam Schreiber suggested that we uh, use her if possible. And so I passed that along to Gino and Gino went ahead and got in contact with her. And yeah, she did a great job. I thought she did a wonderful performance. That's funny because when I heard it, I thought, wow, this chick is awesome. Way better than that Tatiana Gomberg that (laughs) Sam Schreiber wanted us to use. I mean, it's a good thing we used this girl instead of, and then, well, you told us that it was indeed. Indeed. All right. So what things jumped out at you from that story? Did anything jump out at you? Should we just move on? Uh, Maybe maybe we should, but uh, okay. Let me preface this by last episode, we did uh, The Road to Utopia Plane by Rick Kennett. And we had a little bit of discussion off the air about what the story meant. And I realized that I, I wasn't sure what had happened. You know what I mean? Because there was the confusion of Hill Courtenhors having spoken to them days ago and it was just an hour. And, and I, I wasn't quite sure if I got the story. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I, I felt kind of embarrassed. 
I didn't want to ask Rick, hey, when we talked about the story and their relationship and all that, were we all close to right? Or, you know, the, the whole alternate timeline thing being caused by this donuts of gravity rippling down the hull yeah but that thing that you <laughs> described because i honestly i'm i i'm not versed enough in temporal mechanics to know whether donuts on the hull would actually do that i mean maybe crispy cream but not yeah, glazed they have or to be crispy cream with sprinkles for that to happen I, but i didn't want to come off as as incredibly ignorant now here we are a month later face to face and i'm just gonna put it out there i'm not sure I understood Linger. I'm not sure I understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. When he and the author's note mentioned zombie stories, I thought, oh, geez, I didn't get that at all. And, and maybe he's using the word zombie as a catch-all to I, mean what these beings are. Yeah, I think he was using the word zombie as a catch-all to mean an animated corpse. Because these people were dead, but they were not dead. They were undead. I don't think he's saying zombies as in this dead, rotting thing that hungers for the living flesh and chases people through the street kind of zombies. That, that's what he was saying, where he doesn't like stories that stray from that Romero zombie kind of mold. But turns out he wrote one anyways, which he hadn't realized he'd done until somebody else. Oh, somebody else referred story. to it as a zombie story. Right. Okay. See, because I wouldn't have done that. I mean, I, I don't know what I would refer to them as. Uh, to me, Zombonies. Uh, to me, no, no, sir. There, there were no <laughs> ice rinks in the story unless I wasn't paying attention during that scene when they went to Rockefeller Center. Yeah, right? they did. You don't you remember that? Uh, you must have fallen asleep for a minute. If anything, the word that came to mind for me was like angels or reapers, uh, you know, something that, that helps prepare you for the next plane of existence. And yeah, I just I don't know what happened at the end. Can, can yeah, you help it, me out? It was a little confusing. I think from what I could gather, and again, I, I don't know if this is one of those stories that's open to lots of interpretations, and maybe this is just my interpretation, and uh, other people have other interpretations. I suppose in the forums, people can talk about it and say, oh, no, I got this out of it, and you were totally wrong, Big Anklevich, again. <laughs> but what I got from it is that there's these two guys. We have Matthew, who's kind of like the head of the organization or whatever. Then there's Levi, who is, you know, the guy that goes out and tells people. And here and there, and just all over the place, there are people who die but don't. You know, they're dead, but they continue moving about. They're like these creatures, these zombies, but not zombies. And so he has to show up and tell them, hey, you're like this. Don't cause, you know, don't bring notice to yourself. And he and Matthew, I think, know that eventually these disembodied voices that they hear are going to become so loud that they can't handle it anymore. And that's when they're going to have to die for real. And those disembodied voices, I think, were the voices of the restful dead calling out to these unrestful dead. Hey, time for you to come join us. You're dead too. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join yeah, I mean, they're hearing us, that us, kind of stuff us. in their head. And for people like Matthew and Levi, it's a slow process where they steadily start hearing the voices until they need to be put down. But this woman who came to say, hey, you know, don't draw attention to yourself, was already hearing voices only hours after having her accident. And so um, he had to put her down. You know, they didn't explain how this happens or show it to us or tell it to us. But I think, you know, he said that it was some kind of like way he used his voice. And you heard that, you know, Levi had some kind of his real voice and like there was a forcefulness and an unearthly quality to it. And, so, and somehow he uses, she's using the voice. He uses the voice to <laughs> blow the spirit free of the body. That's what I got out of it. Okay, see, I got something much more ominous than Restful Dead from that. Like when she heard the voices, when she says, she's got, I've got one more question. What are the voices? Like the blood drains from his face and he's just like, ah. Like there was something else calling her, something not good, or something not in their organization. They're peaceful don't draw attention to yourself. Try and... I almost got the impression that Matthew and, and Levi Keller were good, were light angels. 
And these voices were the dark angels trying to recruit her onto their side. And again, I totally didn't get it. I admit I didn't get it. <laughs> but that's the impression. There was something scary about the voices. Not, right. Not, you know, oh. And the, and yeah, the I didn't see them opened. as being happy voices. And, and so my conclusion that I got, as wrong as it, may, it sounds like it is, was that he destroyed this woman rather than let her be claimed by the voices. And sorry, Sam Schreiber, well, if, I if, if I misunderstood. I don't know that I'm right. That's kind of my idea versus your idea. And maybe Sam can jump on the forums and let us know the real idea or other people can throw out more interpretations. I don't know. I, it, that's That's one of those things that can be really interesting about fiction is that different people get different things from it. And sometimes that's good. <laughs> sometimes that's the way you want it to be. Other times you're like, oh no, I'm, I'm oh, I, oh, you guys missed it. I meant this. Oh. I've had that happen to me several times where I'm just like, oh, I guess I need to clarify that. Well, and and part of it is the choices that Gino made in his production of it. To a certain extent, anybody who produces a story is going to funnel that story through their interpretation of the story. True. Through their direction, you know, of like how they're going to get the voice actors to read or if they're narrating, how they would like the narration to go. And so I felt that there was an undercurrent of horror in this story, partly because of the music that Gino chose to use, the scariness of the voices. And, and like when... Levi spoke in his his reg, his otherworldly voice. Right, that was a frightening voice. You know, something to make the little street tough like you back away. I said, "Are you lost?" Oh, see, why didn't you do that on the day? <laughs> you look lost, little girl. It's something that we have done before with our own writing, where where we do broken mirror kind of things before. Uh -huh. um, the very first one that you and I ever did, you actually had a line of dialogue that had to be spoken in the story. And it was up to us. And if we had had a bunch of other friends that were also writers, it would have been fun to see how everyone interpreted that line of dialogue. Sort of that was the game of the broken mirror story event was just how many different ways could somebody take that the phone rings in the middle of the night and the person says only one word. And so, again, I'm really grateful that so many people put forth effort and work on, on this and, and, and sent in their stories because, you know, what I'm going to say. But it is, it's a challenge to put your work out there to be, be judged. judged. Yeah. You know, this wasn't just send us all of your scary stories and we'll make an anthology of it. And all of our friends will all have one in there. You know what I mean? It was just like, write something new for this. It will get voted on. And if it gets enough votes, then it will see the light of day kind of thing. So, you know, I, I, I feel bad for somebody who put a lot of effort into and And Sam said that he had sent us stories before and I guess had been brutally rejected. <laughs> Although I, I wouldn't imagine we would be too brutal because we know what it's like to be on the, the other Rejected side. Rejected with prejudice. Yes, that's true. But but that reminds me, uh, sorry, a little sidebar here for the judge uh, bailiff. I read a story of Sam's for the Dribble cast years ago, like 2010 or, or before, uh, called Snakehead. And it was a horror story. And ultimately, our, our buddy Marshall Latham put it on the uh, the journey into podcast oh, okay and and if you wouldn't mind putting a link to that in the show notes hell no big anklevich wait that's me hell no rich Alfie. all right well just use your imaginations that there was a story i read <laughs> called snakehead <laughs> uh, and and you know i i think it ended up being full cast and i believe uh, l scribe harris ended up being my girlfriend in that you wish she was okay I, I, maybe it was Larby Gallagher. So in the, the about the author, you mentioned other places you could hear Sam's work, but uh, here's one more if you want to hear that story. There you go. Uh, it was upsetting, and uh, I, I, th I think I actually got that one. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't happen often, folks. So really, if you want to see a remarkable story, because it's one that Rish actually got, head on over to Journey Into. You talk. I did. I just finished. Gosh. Okay, well, I really love the the premise of somebody coming 
to your house and telling you that you're dead or, you know, and we've seen that in other things. I mean, it is usually angels or the reaper. Yeah. That See sort that of thing. Something like dead like me or totally. those kind of shows. People that don't know they're dead and you need You little... died, Mr. Reynolds. You like the thing to do. You know, you get Haley Joel Osment or whatever who kind of ushers you over to the other side and and I guess I thought that that's where this was going and it didn't go there. But I, I do love that premise. It's been done a bunch of times and I never have tired of that. Of You got to go tell somebody that, you know, they were successful in their suicide attempt. Yeah, it's another thing I find interesting. And this is now our second of the four stories that we will be bringing you not including the incentive episode, is, you know, now we've got our second phone call, our second one-word phone call. So far, we've had two inciting incident phone calls. And so far, the word that the one person says on the other end of the line, I guess it's enough to get the story going, (laughs) but it's not enough to understand what the hell's going on. In both cases so far, it hasn't had anything to do really with the story. It's just been, well, was the one word (laughs) said on the first phone call, and O'Malley's on the other one. So as of yet, the phone call part of the premise hasn't been an integral thing to the story. Just kind of got us going, oh yeah, we need to get from here to there or whatever. We didn't say that the whole story had to hinge on that word. We might have. In mine, I kind of thought about that. uh, In fact, that's the reason I asked that question about, you know, did you come up with the word first? Is because in my mind, the word had to be really, really important, Uh you know, enough for... uh, And and in your story as well, the word is the punchline. It was the... Aside from my little last sentence that everybody hates, and I'll probably have to drop in further editions of the story. Yeah, it was the end of the story was that word. I've guessed when I was writing my story that that's probably the way it would go, that most people would use the word as an inciting incident rather than a conclusion. And so I tried really hard to have it be the conclusion. Oh, to go the other way. Yeah, I wanted to be different that way. So I had originally a different idea, and I was like, no, but that's probably what everybody's going to be like. So I tried to do it the other way around. I guess we'll see. We still have two more stories to go. We'll see where those ones put the phone call. It is kind of interesting. I know that some people were saying after we put out Secret Santa that, oh, this story didn't count because the word wasn't important. And maybe they'll say the same thing about this one because... The word wasn't what was important. It was the fact that the guy didn't like being on the phone. So he only said one word because hearing voices in his head made him think of what was calling for him. See, I just didn't get that. At one point they talked about you're not going to want to go to a movie theater. And I think he said because the screen is too big. Yeah, he said you won't be able to ignore the size of the screen. I think she asked about music, though, and he's like hearing a disembodied voice is the last thing that you're going to want. And so he says live music. Yes. I don't understand. (laughs) Talking on the phone, listening to the radio. There was a point where he gets into his car to go to O'Malley's and the radio comes on and he turns it off right away. She's got it on NPR and it's more disembodied voices. And yeah, all that kind of stuff is that's what's important in this particular story. So I guess it still is kind of integral to the story, but uh, not totally. I mean, you could have totally done without the call and just had him walk into O'Malley's. At the start of the show. But I guess it also gives it a nice circular kind of... Well, he uh, starts out with his wife yeah, and ends he, up with his wife. He gets out of bed and then returns to bed at the end of the story, which is... That's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, one of the really good things about this contest, and you said, you know, you talked about how it's so hard to write something, especially for a contest, and just put it out there like that. For, it, for me, not for Sam Schreiber. <laughs> that's probably true. But it was cool that we've got as many entrants as we did. I mean, we've had other contests that just fell flat on their face. I think there was one where we got like one entry in the contest or two or something like that. It was a terrible failure that time around. But the Broken Mirror Story contest has always seemed to incite people's imagination and really get them excited and want to try and, and be a part of it. 
And so far, you know, it's been a really big success, no matter which iteration of the contest. And there's been three now. This is the third one, right? It's one thing that I've really enjoyed with the show, for sure, is our Broken Mirror contest. And I hope the folks listening enjoy it as well. I mean, these aren't necessarily the same kind of stories. I mean, I don't know if we would get all these stories in our queue, if we would still pick them to do on the show or not. So maybe you get a different kind of story when you listen to the Broken Mirror event than what you would normally get from our show. But I hope people still enjoy it. I hope when they see BMSE before the title of the most recent episode, you know, when it pops up on their thing, they hope they go, oh, cool, and not, oh, crap. I don't know how most people feel, but I hope that's the way it goes. And comment on that on the uh, forums if you are a fan or not. I'd like to know what the feeling is. Are people groaning or are they excited? I'm sure the people who wrote the stories and got their story on the show are excited. But beyond that, are there, is the regular listener a big fan of Broken Mirror? I hope so. I don't know. But if you're not, then it's fine. Because th- there's the good possibility that we do more Broken Mirror contests in the future. If you like them, obviously, it would kind of be the key if everybody hates it, then maybe we won't. But let us know if you like it and you want us to continue doing these. Hey, you mentioned your entry to the Broken Mirror contest. Uh huh. Um, it was called it was Moonlit called... Confession. Yes. It got a one. <laughs> I just, you know, the funny thing is, I was just thinking the other day, it's now been long enough that I don't even remember who gave me the one anymore. That's all right. One. They do. Yeah, I wonder if they remember. But they'll be like, oh, and he's rubbed it in so many times. The, the, what I was going to say, I wasn't <laughs> trying to remind you about the one, because God knows you'll remind us enough. Okay, it got a 10. It did. It, what if there are people out there that would like to hear your entrance? F them. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, yeah, you can hear my entry to the Broken Mirror Story Contest. It will not be appearing on the regular feed, because it got a one. It was not... Therefore, a winner of the contest, but we decided to give people a chance if they want to hear it, that they can hear it as an incentive episode to the show. So if you donate to the show, then we will send you a link once it's still being worked on. It's being produced like the other two uh, Broken Mirror stories that are down the line. It's going to be ready soon. And Larby Gallagher willing, you can hear that story. Yeah, you just donate and then we'll send you the link and you can download it and listen to it. And we even do an episode afterwards where we talk about the story, how it went, etc. And we even have a special guest for that episode. Oh, bye. <laughs> All right. So there were there were one other th- there were one other thing. Wow. I've been speaking English for five years now. You'd think I would have caught on. There was one other thing that we wanted to talk about. We, we went to the New Media Expo last month in Las Vegas, and we, we had a panel that we were actually on. And there was another panel. There was kind of a Doonesty family reunion. Thing, yeah. Or whatever you call meeting for the first time. But without the re, maybe just union. It was like a union. The union of the snake. Not far off. Rise. Those panels are out there that people can listen to. They don't even have to donate to the show to listen to those. That is true, yeah. Over on the That Gets My Goat feed, we have several things related to the whole New Media Expo. If you'd like to check them out, there's three episodes that we recorded in Rish's car as we drove to Las Vegas, where we talked about this, that, the other, what we expected of the New Media Expo, what we were going to do in the upcoming year, so on and so forth. And you can listen to those three episodes. Also... There are the two panels, the one in which Rish and I were on, and also their other panel had Renee Chambliss, Marshall Latham, and Brian Lincoln on it. Our panel had uh, Abby Hilton and L. Scribe Harris on it, as well as us. So those are the seven people that you've hear, heard plenty of times on the Dune Steve. You can hear what we had to say on our panels. You can just listen to them free of charge. Also, after the panels, there is the big extravaganza episode, the spectacular 102nd episode of That Gets My Goat. It's a big anniversary, so we really did it upright. Right. It's the longest episode we've done. 
for That Gets My Goat. And we talk about going there and food poisoning and karaoke and doing the panels and doing live readings with everybody and then the the people trying to give us pornography and <laughs> getting lost. And I thought it was really fun. Hopefully people really dug that episode because if you've never listened to That Gets My Goat, it's basically what you're listening to now, the post-story conversation we just talk about something in each episode. Yeah, it's uh, the post story conversation minus the story is basically what that gets my goat is. So if you haven't listened to it, you should check it out. You can find it on our blog. You can go and you can sign up for it. It's also on iTunes. So you can just go to iTunes like you would normally and sign up for it there. But our blog is dunesteef.blogspot.com. You can go and you can see we've also got blog posts on our blog as well. Aside from the regular uh, That Gets My Goat podcasts that appear there. And uh, also, if you uh, are interested, Big Inklevich has a blog. Does he? Now. He does. <laughs> you can find it at biginklevich.blogspot.com. And over there, uh, you can find pictures and other stuff from the New Media Expo. I did a post all about our karaoke night so you could see videos that i took oh, that's right of all of us singing our songs you could see rish singing elton john or big singing duran squared <laughs> or you could even see renee singing la bamba that's right. She did the whole thing in Spanish. You can go check that kind of stuff out over there. And I also have started up kind of a third podcast, or is it the fourth? Does the podcast that dares not speak his name count as the third? I don't know. Sometimes I've been tempted to put that other podcast on here just to see if people like it. But just like everybody that's not Sam Schreiber, I'm too afraid <laughs> to put my name out there. But anyways, yeah, I started a another podcast, which is basically just me talking about what I should be doing, how I'm writing, how things are going. I told a couple stories. I told a story about something unspeakable that happened to me at the New Media Expo. And uh, yeah, that's called The Ankle Cast. And uh, you can check that out over at my blog. And even Rich Outfield has a blog for that matter. You can find richoutfield.blogspot.com where he talks about this, that and the other things. So if you like the Dune, Steve, there's more to be had out there. You should check it out. As far as the New Media Expo goes, they have asked us to come back next year. And so if you'd like to get a glimpse of what that was like this year to help you decide to come next year and karaoke with, I mean, <laughs> learn all about new media, alternate uh, broadcasting forms and how to monetize then yes, you feel free to listen to any of those things. Uh, I, as far as I know, everybody in our group has also done on yeah. their podcast a summary of what happened or a highlights reel kind of thing. And that, to me, that's been very fun to see what Brian thought was important enough to mention, to see what you decided to dwell on, to see what maybe Marshall was covering. <laughs> All together, you get like a five-hour every single detail multiple coverage of from many angles that's right it's multiple camera shoot but yeah so you can check all that stuff out otherwise i think uh, we only have one more thing for you before we go abigail hilton who came with us to the new media expo mentioned to us just the other day that she has a new promo for her cowrie catchers series that she has going on right now so we thought we would bring that to you as a special treat uh shoot oh wait oh is still frozen let me see if i can figure out which button it is uh i think it's this one we're gonna teach you how to skip rope so grab your rope and let's do the skip rope skip rope skip rope oh oh oh, oh no. god no, uh, <laughs> how do i, how do I okay. stop it what that is is that's the jump rope song that, that that's that's gonna be our new theme here at the dune steve wait Unless wait what people donate to the show i i just I thought that it, may, it was maybe the worst song I'd ever, ever heard. But it, in a way that I was just like, wow, that was terrible. I got to listen to it again. And so, <laughs> but yeah, if people were wondering, wait, what the hell? Why were you starting with that terrible song? That's why. That's going to be our new theme, unless you donate. Right. So unless you want to hear this week after week, you better donate. <laughs> okay, sorry. Now let me try again. Let me see if I can figure out the button you need to push. The voyage will be dangerous. 
It may involve fights with temple ships, and it will almost certainly offend the sensibilities of the current administration of Major Major, as well as the priestess and her, um, what did you call them? Pet lizards. You had him at Dangerous. The Guild of the Cowry Catchers, a novel of pirates and Panamandora. You made me sad, Gerard. Come back. Come back, and maybe I won't make so many things bleed. Written and narrated by Abigail Hilton. Book four, Out of the Ashes. A Grishnard, a Foxling, a Leopon, a Leon, an Ocelon, and you, a half-breed who acts more Grishnard than he looks and brought a plague upon his last allies. A forbidden book. Wayne, for a smart person, you can be pretty stupid. I don't know anyone else like that. No one asked your opinion. A pirate prince. Polivar, what are you doing? An idea whose time has come. The Guild of the Cowrie Catchers. Find the story at cowriecatchers.com or subscribe in Podio Books, iTunes, or your favorite podcatcher. So we are. So we are. Let's go change the world. All right, so there you go. Check it out. Cowrycatchers.com is their website, right? For that book. So head over and check that out. If you haven't already, it's really good stuff. Full cast. But it's not for children. If you can be offended, you what did she say? If you, if you think you may be offended, you probably will. There you right? go. So, yeah, check it out. It's a full cast novel. It's good stuff. I think you'll enjoy it. And yeah, so that's our show for today. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody, all the way to the end. Thank you, Gino Moreto. <laughs> Despite the explanation, you still do Gino. it. Okay. Ti prego per tu participazione. Ah, la piazza mia. Yeah, and thanks to Sam Schreiber for his story. Thanks for, you know, having the guts to put it out there and participating in our Broken Mirror contest. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Alfield. <laughs> manja, manja. Cue the hate mail. Thanks for listening. Awful. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Anybody want to paint it? Take two. Why she's never heard of this kind of thing before. Why she's never heard of this kind of thing before. I'd be damned if I was going to let Martha know that, that, that you can't ever take a shit again. That would be so sad, you know. All the things I would be willing to give up, but that's just not one of them. That's the high point of your week, <laughs> sir. By Sam Schreiber. Yeah. Sam it's Schreiber. It's- Das Wetter ist furchtbar, nicht wahr? Ja, es regnet und regnet. Aber der Wind ist kühl. That's my, uh, I can remember a small portion of the, some of the dialogues that I had to do in my German class. Es tut mir leid, aber ich bin nicht aus Wien. Wow. <laughs> Somewhere a woman is becoming lubricated from your German, but it doesn't work on me. Yeah, the sad thing Because German is ugly to me. The sad thing is, she's one of those roided up German weightlifter women <laughs> from the 70s in the Olympics. <laughs> but tonight I'm slower than usual. Tonight I'm smaller than usual. It's cold. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. 
and something was in your mouth. <laughs> I'm sick. He's just getting over sickness. Uh, so part of the uh, the brilliant acting in this character is uh, me being sick. Makes the graveliness more realistic. She lets out a laugh that sounds like a bark. <laughs> well. She tells me. That just. <clears throat> Whoa. <clears throat> That's my barking laugh. It wasn't a burp. Your world is strange and frightening to me. For the first time in years, I curse. <laughs> Ms. Racta. <laughs> You're gonna linger longer. <laughs> Lo- <laughs> Martha narrows her eyes. Was her name always Martha? Yeah. It just occurred to me that that's an old woman's name. Sometimes I think that's a blessing. A tincture against un... Un... A tincture against unmanageable, unreasonably... Un... Help? That's not true. She says, deadly calm. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No! That's not true! That's impossible! You can destroy the Emperor. It is your destiny. Join me and together we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. Alright, let's give it a shot. What the hell? So, what still works? She asks. Well, not your dick, but I wouldn't imagine that would have worked before, I say. And that pleasureless physical intimacy isn't so great a price to pay. Big experiences it every six months. <sighs> you hopefully you're saving some of these, Gino. <laughs> the funny thing is, though, he's a Kiwi. I know. He was born in like Britain. I don't know that that'll really work so well because not really applicable. If there's a derogatory term for kiwis, more derogatory than kiwi, <laughs> it's possible that kiwi is derogatory. That it started out as I derogatory. I bet it originally but... was, or something. I don't know. It's just that stupid bird. Yeah, that's why they call him that because that's where the bird lives, right? Right. But it's like like Yankee started out as a positive, and then it became like a a negative, and now it's like f you. We're Americans. We don't care that you call it Yankees. And I wonder if Kiwi was like that at first, too. It was like, they come from the land of the Kiwi. And then it's like, yeah, the bloody Kiwis. And then eventually it's like, we're all Kiwi. Yay, I love eating Kiwis. Both the birds and the fruits. They're both tasty. Kiwi birds are a little more crunchy, though. Okay. (laughs) You've been recording all this time? All this time. The river flowed. Endlessly to the sea. Try, try. Try to let it ride. Let it ride. Minecraft. Manx man. 139. Good one. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.